everyone. Welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anam Akood, with you at P2B World in today's show. We will be talking about two very important topics. The first is, of course, with reference to the Prime Minister's visit earlier today to Diyar Khan, where he laid the foundation stone for some very important development projects. And, of course, uh, the uplifting of these areas is something that the Prime Minister also emphasized and talked about how this was something that wasn't done in the past, that wasn't taken care of. But it is one of the priorities of the current government, and they will be looking after it for the next uh, eight months. Uh, that they are in power at least. And then when we take a look at the situation in terms of, of course, uh, the economic and political stability, it seems that as part of the government's efforts towards bringing more stability in both these domains, uh, these development projects are also going to contribute towards that. The Prime Minister in his address also talked about the issue of terrorism and how that has also uh, been something that has once again uh, struck Pakistan and needs to be resolved. And so this is also going to be something that the government will focus on, especially in the areas that the Prime Minister visited today and the importance uh, that, of course, uh, these areas require in terms of the security uh, that it does. And then also in terms of, of course, uh, the government's efforts towards uh, the overall political development of that particular area and the economic uplift, this particular visit is important. But we're also going to take a look at what this means in general for the government's priorities, in the, especially in the economic domains, and how exactly uh, the plans for the completion of these projects are going to go ahead. Uh, since, of course, we've discussed this in the past as well, that when we, whenever there is uh, the uh, foundation of any particular project, the way that it's going to uh, be uh, pursued, uh, the way it's going to be implemented is, of course, important, especially with regards to political stability's concern and, of, of course, also the elections, uh, which are not that far away. So we're going to be taking a look at that in our first segment of the show today. And closely related, we're going to take a look in the second segment at the overall economic situation of the country uh, where we stand today. Uh, there is uh, some good news coming in uh, from the Pakistan Stock Exchange, which opened the week in green, and the benchmark uh, index gained about four. 85.96 points and closed at 40,155.16 points, which is up 1.23%. Um, and it is good news coming in now, but there's obviously concern in terms of its sustainability, uh, especially also that this is a rule of the week. And then when we take a look at the situation where Pakistan stands in terms of its foreign exchange reserves and in terms of the IMF review, there are, of course, a lot of question marks as to what measures are going to be required for Pakistan to be able to go ahead uh, with its commitments and challenges in the remaining fiscal year. So that's what we're going to look at in the second segment of our show today. For this and more, as always, in the studios, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Patafi. And today, we've also been joined in the studios by Executive Director, Prime Institute, Mr. Ali Salman. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali, for joining us and being a part of the debate. We've also been joined online by our guest, Dr. Niaz Murtaza, who's a political analyst, and also Dr. Akhtas Abzal, who's an economist. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being a part of the show today. Uh, let me start with you, Dr. Niaz. Considering, of course, uh, the Prime Minister's visit and the importance that it holds, there is, of course, a lot of concern in terms of the development projects, especially in terms of the social and economic uplift of uh, areas such as Diyai Khan. Uh, but of course, what's also important is for us to be able to see the completion of such projects and to be able to ensure that the kind of uplift uh, we are trying to aim for is something that actually trickles down to its people. What do you make of the foundation length uh, of uh, various projects today and the, the priority that is being given to this part of Pakistan? Uh, clearly, you know, uh, given the uh, uh, economic situation in the country and, you know, what people have gone through uh, with, you know, about four years of high inflation, the COVID impact, uh, then, you know, the floods and the overall uh, economic situation because of the global recession, uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, you know, serious uh, uh, economic troubles that, you know, people are facing, especially in far flung areas like Dera Smile Khan, uh, which is, you know, one of the most backward areas in Pakistan. And this area has seen a lot of conflict as well, a lot of, you know, movement of Afghan refugees and so on. So clearly it's an area which, uh, you know, uh, deserves as much attention as it can get. So, you know, whatever uh, the government can do, given all the constraints that it is facing, fiscally, it's a good idea to try to get, you know, some money into the pockets of people, you know, uh, get them to be able to stand on their own feet, give them income opportunities. So I think all in all, that's all uh, very useful. Right, absolutely. Um, and Dr. Agdas, considering, of course, that uh, the, the Prime Minister has also emphasized 
um, on the overall economic uplift of the country as well. And of course, this is a priority for the government uh, in the remaining fiscal year as well and in the remaining eight months of the current political setup also. Uh, but in terms of uh, where we stand today, especially in, in areas such as the Aik Khan or others like in Balochistan as well, where we uh, of course haven't seen the kind of uh, priority being given in the past or haven't seen the kind of work done that is required for their social and economic uplift. Uh, what do you make in terms of the, the, the necessity in terms of making sure that the implementation is carried out and the kind of infrastructure that is required to uh, be able to achieve the kind of results that we have laid the foundation for today? Is that something also uh, that is uh, being given a priority at the moment? Thank you very much for inviting me to your show. Yes, I think um, paying attention to areas like Bay Khan, which uh, as Dr. Niaz Murtaza mentioned, is one of the uh, somewhat less developed uh, area of Pakistan is going to be key in bringing up, uh, uh, you know, uh, areas that have not seen the kind of development that has happened in the rest of the country. Um, so that is going to be the key. And I think it's very, uh, it's a very welcome step from the government, uh, from the prime minister, especially to visit the Ai Khan. And I think as far as your question about implementation uh, is concerned, I think that is going to be the key because we have seen a number of promises being made, not only by this government, by previous administrations and governments, where has Pakistan um, has been found lacking when it comes to implementation. So I think um, implementation will remain uh, the key. And I think coming months uh, will show how serious the government is in bringing about development and economic growth in places like D.I. Khan. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Ali Salman, considering, of course, that we have had serious issues with regards to political stability, um, even in the recent past and perhaps even before that, and then we're also at a situation where we have numerous economic challenges, despite the kind of tough measures that the government has been taking to help improve uh, the economic situation. At this point, where we stand today with regards to both these domains, uh, the, the kind of uh, resources, the kind of efforts that, that go into uh, development projects such as those uh, whose foundations have been laid today, uh, is Pakistan is, a, is in a position to be able to carry forward these projects and to be able to inaugurate them? Uh, yes, I think this is important to, to highlight that what is the you know, real potential of investment in, in uh, such areas. Mm. And it is important to also highlight uh, the comparative advantage of these regions. For instance, you know, Dera Ismail Khan is uh, potentially known as an important area, uh, you know, lying on the western, ra western route of CPAC, but also potentially a uh, hub of agro processing zone. So, if it is, you know, uh, if the development spending uh, and if the government efforts and policies are aligned with the potential of this area, then I'm sure um, there will be substantial gains to be made. And it's not, uh, by the way, the responsibility of the government only to invest in such areas. It has to be a public-private partnership. Uh, the government has to create incentives so that the both domestic investors and foreign investors uh, find these opportunities uh, in places like D.I. Khan. And I'm sure we can uh, do a significant value addition by appropriate investment uh, in this region, especially in the agro-processing industries. Right. Um, Farooq, considering, of course, that uh, we have seen in the past as well, there is there is a lot of blame that is being given to how past governments have uh, dealt with certain regions or the kind of priorities uh, that they have set, which um, has either benefited or damaged the country, depending on the perspective. But when we take a look at uh, the situation in, in areas such as the Aik Khan or in Balochistan, there's, of course, a lot that uh, needs to be done. But as uh, Mr. Ali was mentioning, if there is perhaps a more communal approach towards uh, the uplift of these areas, we may be able to get better results. Is that something that we can even start talking about now or moving towards? Because it seems at the end of the day, it's, it's still more of a government-centric approach. All right, uh, Sana. And that is very important uh, to understand what has gone wrong. Uh, you know, in Pakistan, whenever you talk about development, most of the regions that were more populated or uh, closer to the bigger cities, that got, uh, they got uh, the lion's share of development funds and support by the governments. Uh, but uh, in uh, particular areas, like as you mentioned, 44 percent of Pakistan is Balochistan alone. And then a substantive part of uh, 
a substantial part of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is the South Punjab, uh, South uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region where the uh, DIK is also uh, you know situated. Similarly, Southern Punjab, uh, parts of uh, uh, you know inner Sindh or rural Sindh, all of them were neglected, and it is high time that we start focusing on them. Now, what has changed at this moment, Sana? Uh, particularly regarding the previous government, it uh, uh, actually talked a great ga game. It kept on uh, continuously talking about how it is going to actually uplift people out of poverty. But we saw that there was a lot of focus on talks and uh, rather less development or investment in these underdeveloped areas, particularly in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, even at this moment, if you look at it, PTI is in government, and FATA, uh, or ex FATA parts of the uh, of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, newly merged areas, they have not received the kind of financial uh, support that was committed by provinces and the federation. So at this moment, what has changed, Sana, is basically CPEC, uh, because it is going to bring the entire country together. It is going to uh, open avenues of trade, economics, and development as well. Similarly, of course, because at this time, there is this coalition of multi-party, uh, many parties, which includes, uh, you know, JUIF as well. So every part is represented, and then a focus is there as well. Regarding public-private partnerships, Sana, the biggest problem is that when you talk about government of Pakistan uh, and the state of Pakistan particularly, it will have to define or redefine its priorities. Uh, we repeatedly in this program have been saying that uh, whenever you talk about subsidies given to certain sectors, you know, there is a lot of incentive in real estate sector mm. and there is hardly any in a lot of economic uh, uh, you know, projects that might be able to <coughs> create something that can be exported. You cannot export real estate. So the governments of Pakistan or gov government of Pakistan and provinces will also have to resolve this. And then they'll have to focus on uh, you know, human development first. And there comes the role of uh, private sector. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our pri uh, private sector uh, because it was so harassed in the past, is also circumspect. It is also reluctant to uh, diversify its portfolio. But if there are policies which encourage them to ex expand to those regions as well, why would they not? Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Agnes, these are serious challenges, of course, when we talk about uh, the social and economic uplift of any particular region in Pakistan, and especially these areas. And so, of course, when we take a look at the way that uh, the pol current political setup or any government needs to uh, uh, give priority, there is perhaps a more holistic uh, approach that needs to be taken in. But with regards to the kind of uh, political instability that we've seen, the issue of terrorism that we've now seen, or the kind of current economic challenges that we've faced, um, how exactly can we move towards uh, such fundamental requirements uh, with regards to especially dealing with such important projects in provinces and in the country? Thank you for that question. I think that is a very important question. Look, um, investments in human capital, primarily education and health and clean drinking water, are going to form the foundation or the bedrock of future uh, development, human development in Pakistan. And I think in order to achieve that, where we do need economic growth, um, it, it has to be said that whatever economic growth we are talking about is probably not going to come about unless there is political stability in Pakistan. And I think that is one thing that is now making a lot of people very nervous, including myself, that for some reason Pakistan does not seem to be reaching a political equilibrium. And I think uh, the political forces, political um, leadership of all political parties needs to have this in mind. They need to have uh, this idea that without political equilibrium or the end of this political chaos, uh, further economic growth, economic development, investments in human capital or human development is going to be uh, very, very hard to come by. So I think I really hope that in the coming year, uh, different political forces and stakeholders in this country can realize this and can sit across the table from each other and chart out the rules of the game 
uh, that are going to assist everybody in reaching a political equilibrium. Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Diaz, this is a big should that we keep referring to. And of course, this is something that we absolutely need. But at the end of the day, uh, it still seems uh, something uh, which, which perhaps unfortunately is unreachable at the moment. And the kind of uh, events that we have seen, especially in the recent past and perhaps previously also, um, are, are evident of that. And so when we take a look at how closely this is related and how uh, badly uh, uh, we uh, had uh, the potential uh, of uh, crashing in terms of the way that uh, the global challenges were happening, that we still, of course, are facing them and the current economic challenges and then the flood situation. Um, we, we uh, of course, there were parallels being drawn to defaults. And even though it had been reiterated by the top leadership and the finance ministry that we're not going to default, we are facing some pretty serious challenges. And so it even even then we feel that it it's not been enough push uh, towards the kind of political consensus that we need. And if this isn't it, what is going to bring us towards that? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, the big worry uh, that we face. Uh, you know, there is the economic challenge. Uh, there is, you know, the political instability. There is the global recession. Uh, there are the floods. And now it seems that, you know, there may even be an uptick uh, in terrorism, which we had, you know, very successfully been able to contain a few years back. And then, you know, the news coming from China about, you know, COVID rising again and we being so close to China. So all in all, you know, it's uh, becoming a more and more complicated situation uh, from every angle, political, economic, natural, uh, global. And this is, you know, the time that we need all uh, political forces to come together. And you try to, you know, focus on the problems of the country rather than, you know, your own uh, you know, chasing of power, your own desire for power. This is the time to, you know, really focus on the people. I, I don't think the situation is, uh, you know, right at this time to have more political instability, to a change of government, to elections uh, immediately. What we need is, you know, a period of about eight to ten months where we can, you know, give relief to people. You know, we've gone through four years of inflation, COVID, this, that. And people uh, need uh, you know, some sort of relief and some sort of stability. So it's unfortunate that you know we haven't been able to reach that kind of a political consensus. And I think that's uh, really the need of the hour for everybody to you know behave responsibly as statespersons rather than you know just politicians chasing power and looking at you know the quickest way of trying to you know come back to power. Right, that is, of course, the hope. Uh, Mr. Ali, when we take a look at, of course, the, the number of challenges that exist, another one, as Dr. Niaz was also mentioning, is the one that's spiking up, is the issue of terrorism, what the Prime Minister also referred to as something that is, of course, the priority of the government. But uh, we have seen in the past also uh, that there have been uh, perhaps um, uh, different measures taken in terms of being uh, able to resolve this issue. There was also uh, an option of dialogue with the TPP. Uh, but unfortunately, it seems that where we stand today is um, almost coming back to where we started. Um, and because of that, uh, uh, this is important that we reevaluate uh, how we move forward and uh, think about the kind of strategies that we've employed in the past and how we can change that. But do you think that there is any serious efforts towards that as well? Because we have, of course, national action plans or a national security policy, but we still don't really see an alignment in terms of uh, what's happening on ground. Yeah, I think it's one of the you know, important challenges we are facing again as a, as a nation state. Uh, the bigger, I think, discussion has to be around that uh, the, the, the narrative around between geopolitics and geoeconomic, right? Mm. So we have heard a lot about it in the last few years, um, and we have heard that government, establishment um, have been saying that, okay, Pakistan needs to pivot from geopolitics to geoeconomics, which means essentially that, uh, you know, you have to, as a nation, uh, maintain peaceful relationship with all neighboring countries. That is the very first step for, uh, for regional peace, for prosperity of all the nations. Um, and it seems to me, uh, as an observer, that um, this, is, uh, you know, uh, this has been there in, in narrative, but not in practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe we are coming up with other policies, maybe we were talking about internal security, but I think the real paradigm shift has not happened. 
and what we observed in, in Afghanistan uh, last year, I think points out that still, uh, you know, there are this geopolitical rents to be secured, uh, which is not consistent uh, with the economic interests of uh, 220 million Pakistanis. Right. And that shift has to be made. Right, absolutely. Um, and and Farooq, um, I'd like to get your view on that as well in terms of what Pakistan uh, has been moving towards, especially in the past year or so, with regards to uh, the relationships that it has with its neighbors, including Afghanistan and India as well, and especially the impact that that has had on our economic situation and how that can be changed. Whether sure. or not that's even an option considering the political dynamics. Right. Uh, Sana, when it was being said uh, uh, regarding our paradigm shift, I kept on thinking that why is it that we think too big? Uh, you know, geopolitics, geoeconomics, both have geo in it. Forget about geo. Talk about economics only, right? Politics is already here. Let us first fix what is broken. Then we can go beyond anything else, right? Regarding our neighborhood, I'm a card-carrying supporter of peace with India. Uh, and also with Afghanistan, but I cannot wish into existence something that is not there. Mm. If the governments there are not going to listen and they are going to be boorish, if they are going to be arrogant, I cannot just surrender all the national pride and say, for heaven's sake, for God's sake, uh, make peace with us, because that, that emboldens their attitude, right? So we'll have to wait, it, uh, wait out every negative uh, you know, impulse that might be brewing in the n Indian region. And then, first of all, we have to focus on the na national economy first. We have to look at our own national interest. And I, I believe that all this, uh, you know, uh, departure from our own geography into extended geography is some, something that really worries me. And it all actually takes me back to something that I wrote back in uh, June, Sana, an article called F Article 15. Actually, Article 15, the title is also uh, borrowed from a joke, uh, an African joke, okay. where they say that while the Constitution does not apply, there is one article, which is Article 15, that definitely applies on everyone, and that is fend for yourself. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, in that article, there was this banker who had actually said that Pakistan's problem is no nothing else. It is not stability. Again, uh, it is a big country with 220 million people. You cannot have the kind of graveyard stability or silence that you want. There, something will keep on brewing. But what uh, our biggest problem at this moment is, in, is lack of competence. And that seems to be the case. Every time uh, you know, there is a crisis, you know the circumstances are challenging us, Sana, because we have stopped challenging ourselves. I d every day I don't actually wake up and ask myself what am I going to improve today? How am I going to actually behave now? If we start focusing on fundamentals of economy and our competence and our capacity building, so now all these pipe dreams about uh, you know regional trade and economics and uh, you know uh, uh, having a peaceful neighborhood in which everyone is a stakeholder will become secondary because then we will be able to stand on our feet. Mm. And then if somebody tries to bully us, we can push back. If somebody wants to build peace with us, we will be there supporting them and talking to them as well. All right. We'll continue the discussion. Let's take a short break over here and we'll be back with a focus on the economy of the country. meticulous discussions and in-depth analyses about stories that matter the most. We underline key events as and when they happen. Watch Newsroom with me, Umar Khalid Bhatt, for a daily roundup of the latest international and local top stories.
Welcome back to the debate. Uh, we're talking about, of course, the important issues of the country uh, which center around the economic situation. We've seen some good news coming in, particularly this week, uh, where the shares at the TSX opened uh, with green. Uh, the benchmark ASE 100 index gained 485.96 points, and the index closed at 40,155.16 points, which is up 1.23 percent. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of factors that this is being attributed to, but we're going to try and um, layer out exactly what is happening and try and understand uh, the situation as it is and to see what are the challenges that uh, the country faces in the remaining fiscal year and how uh, do we plan to tackle them. Uh, let me start with you, um, uh, Dr. Agdis, considering, of course, uh, the situation uh, at the moment, uh, especially in terms of uh, the kind of positive gains that we've witnessed um, today, um, there is, of course, a lot of concern in terms of how sustainable this is and how this is going to uh, help in the overall economic situation of the country. There's, of course, a lot that we're expecting in terms of uh, helping the situation with regards to the IMF 9th review, for which, of course, there are efforts being done, um, and then also the kind of inflows that we're expecting, particularly from Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, but wh where we stand today um, in terms of the challenges that exist, in terms of the gains that we have achieved so far, how do you see the situation um, as of now? And especially in terms of where we stand today, whether it's going to be sustainable, since especially this is the rollover week. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think um, as far as the sustainability of what we have witnessed in the stock exchange is concerned, I think I don't have a crystal ball. But uh, it certainly seems that the market is responding positively to some of the efforts that the government has started putting in, especially in terms of addressing the circular debt as far as the gas sector is concerned. And I think that is really signaling to the market that this government, this administration, is serious about addressing issues of uh, circular debt in the energy sector. And that, I want to remind your viewers, it was one of the conditions laid down with, by the IMF. So yeah. I think all in all, I see, um, you know, I see our economy moving towards a slightly more stable um, situation. Um, and I say this, of course, um, with the caveat that if certain things that are causing uncertainty and instability and chaos in Pakistan, uh, so I'm here I'm referring to uh, inability of our political actors in reaching any kind of consensus or agreement on when the elections are going to be. Uh, I hear I'm talking about the rise and uptick in terrorism especially in um, border areas of Pakistan. And here I'm talking about a global economic turmoil that is not showing any signs of abatement. Um, you know, if those three things don't come down or they cannot be, um, you know, if, if, they, if, if, if we cannot be in a position where these three things are coming down, I think the gains that we have seen today, uh, I'm afraid to say, are not going to be sustainable. But certainly when it comes to the government's efforts, I see initiative, I see uh, drive, and I see the will, the political will, to address some long-standing issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, addressing uh, circular debt in the energy sector, which uh, to which the market is also responding positively. So I think um, I think the situation is, is, is uh, challenging, and I think the government is making the right uh, noises. But um, what happens is going to be a function of many other variables that are beyond the control of this administration or government. Right. All right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, Dr. Niaz, considering, of course, the, the importance of uh, uh, reducing circular debt in the gas sector or the energy sector, I understand also that, of course, there is uh, the, the impact that it's going to have on the ninth review and how that was a requirement, but also in terms of the kind of measures that have been taken there is, of course, the formation of a committee which is going to uh, address these challenges, um, and that's important. But I want to understand this uh, uh, as, as what significance does the measure itself hold, because we've had uh, committees being formed in the past as well. We have bodies, we have setups, we have infrastructures or structures which are looking after uh, certain challenges. But at the end of the day, of course, there are many that still remain. How exactly do you think uh, uh, this particular committee or the measures taken right now to address circular debt in the energy sector um, are going to be tackled with through this mechanism? Are we moving towards the right direction? I mean, you know, there have been so many attempts to address this circular debt by different governments. Uh, 
I remember when uh, the PMLN had first come into power after 2013, one of the first few steps that uh, Mr. Adhikar, the current finance minister, had taken was to, you know, cover uh, from uh, government coffers, you know, the amount of circular debt. And then, you know, there was a claim that, you know, this will help, you know, resolve the issue once and for all. But then you know, we saw that, you know, throughout the PMLN government, it kept increasing. Then throughout the four years of PTI, it kept increasing uh, because, you know, uh, you pay off uh, the debt, but then, you know, the uh, root causes do not get addressed, you know, especially with electricity. You know, there are huge issues of, you know, uh, electricity theft, uh, non-recovery of bills, not even just from, you know, uh, your consumers, but even, you know, many large uh, uh, government departments, and it all keeps adding up. So we need to, you know, see a decisive action on addressing, you know, some of the root causes, which also include, you know, expensive sources of, you know, uh, power generation, a lot of, you know, imported fuel, uh, and then, you know, if the price of that goes up, if there's devaluation, that adds to the price. So, you know, there's a lot of factors. And uh, then, of course, you know, circular debt is just one issue. Uh, which is holding back, uh, you know, a movement of the IMF deal. You know, there are other issues like, you know, the exchange rate uh, devaluation, the issue of, you know, taxes, and then uh, the issue of, you know, fuel prices. Uh, so uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty just because of the fact that we aren't able to, you know, move forward and close the IMF deal and get the next, uh, uh, you know, installment released, and that's holding back money from a lot of bilateral and multilateral donors, and it's you know really putting pressure on your uh, foreign exchange reserves, which have now fallen to you know near uh, just around six uh, billion dollars. This is the state bank reserve. So I think the crucial uh, you know priority for the government should be to somehow uh, you know get this uh, IMF deal in place and you know get the uh, installment released. I understand you know there's a lot of tough political uh, decisions that will be involved, which might harm, uh, you know, the political fortunes of the government. But then if, you know, the IMF deal falls through, it doesn't come uh, through, then, you know, the kind of economic mess that we'll have will be, you know, much bigger uh, than taking the step that the IMF government is, you know, demanding. So I think one way or the other, you know, in the next one or two weeks, uh, the government has to resolve all these issues and send out the message to the market that, you know, the IMF and the government have come to an agreement and, you know, there will be a release of the installment very soon in the next year. Otherwise, I think the economic situation will deteriorate much further. All right. Um, Mr. Ali, considering, of course, that there are many challenges uh, which, which are beyond uh, Pakistan's control, especially in terms of the kind of uh, global factors uh, that exist at the moment, as uh, Dr. Akshat was earlier mentioning. And there's, of course, other issues um, that seem also, uh, unfortunately, beyond uh, um, any possibility. Um, of course, it, it could happen, but it hasn't happened so far in so issue, issues like, of course, political stability. But when we take a look at uh, the situation at the moment, um, th we understand that there are tough measures and tough calls that needed to be made by the government. But considering the challenges that lie ahead uh, in the remaining fiscal year, and the priority that the government is, of course, setting on uh, the IMF Ninth Review and the kind of measures that are needed, uh, do you think that all of the action measures that could have been taken or uh, that are needed at the moment have been taken care of and that the government has uh, been able to do all of the options that were available to them? And so we're, we're doing the best that we could. Well, my short answer is uh, no. Uh, and my long answer is that one of the fundamental sticking points between uh, the IMF and Pakistan government right now is uh, you know, import restrictions or import controls. And um, you know, that goes against the very fundamental um, agreement on free trade, which uh, we have been as a think tank uh, favoring that Pakistan should adopt. Um, and the, you know, what the problem is, it's, it's like um, uh, it's, it's hitting us now. Uh, the import controls uh, are hitting us in a, in a multiple uh, manner. Uh, first of all, what has happened, it, it has created uh, two or possibly three exchange rates in the market, mm -hmm. uh, interbank market uh, rate, um, you know, the open market rate and the black market rate. And, uh, and that is single most factor is driving, I think, uh, the most important uncertainty 
in the international uh, transactions which Pakistan is dealing with. The LCs are not being open. Today uh, we saw uh, advertisement from uh, one of the largest sector in the country, uh, steel sector, calling, you know, call asking about relaxation on, on LCs, which has downstream industries throughout the construction sector. And uh, also this multiplicity of the exchange rate has, uh, you know, is, is bringing in remittances down through the official channels which means that um, at the time when Pakistan needs a greater flow of uh, dollars, we are actually having less of it. And um, that is you know, adding to the problem. So by not doing uh, one textbook uh, policy, keeping the exchange rate open, mm. letting uh, it adjust automatically, especially for countries like Pakistan, when in countries like Pakistan, when the forex exchange reserves are low, the only strategy is to keep the exchange rate open. Okay. And it provides an automatic check. And that is not something we're doing. And that is but this but is the short but term. If, if this is so textbook, why is it that we're not doing? Is there a concern there? Well, um, I think this goes against the very grain of uh, the finance minister, who is known for uh, you know, uh, directing or, or having a desirable for an exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, uh, that, that, that worked a, a seven or eight years ago when the international situation was very different, uh, when we had uh, CPEC dollars coming in, but now we are not, um, you know, we are not witnessing that. We d we don't know, there's no fresh FDI. Uh, the international situation has changed. The global interest rates have gone up tremendously. Even domestic rates have gone up tremendously. So the whole scenario has changed. And in this scenario, uh, that kind of policy, although uh, officially speaking, it is not being said, uh, the official statement, of the finance ministry is that they are not doing any artificial inter intervention. But when it, you look at the administrative controls, effectively, it is a control. OK. Um, uh, Farooq, and I'm sure uh, you have something to add to that. But um, let me also put another question since we're short on time. Considering, of course, the way that uh, uh, the, the, the talk uh, is being uh, uh, mentioned, especially in terms of media reports and in terms of what we keep on hearing, uh, from uh, the uh, parties such as uh, the PTI or other opposition parties as well. And when we take a look at the situation with regards to where Pakistan stands, there was, of course, a lot of speculation around default, which is also harming uh, the current economic situation. And then, of course, where we stand today, uh, there is, of course, a lot of, uh, that is uh, that is impacted by the way uh, we present the story. Um, and, of course, uh, the role of media is also very important, but the, the role of uh, being able to end this speculations and being able to clarify what is going on is also very important. How much do you think um, an effort needs to be made towards this aspect in the remaining six to a year? All right, uh, Sana, when you talk about Pakistani media and its coverage of the economy, it actually reminds me of a television series, a sci-fi series called Fringe, in which the lead scientist actually removes a part of his brain so that he can get rid of certain important memories. So uh, my, uh, you know, comp continuous complaint has been in the past many years that our media systematically has actually cut off its uh, you know, economic arm that actually used to cover the uh, economics or business activities in the country. How many bulletins do you see on television channels covering uh, business uh, activities in the country? So the, uh, you know, the second thing that it reminds me of is uh, uh, Ishfaq Ahmed Saab, renowned playwright, who in uh, one of his programs called Zavia actually reminded you of a uh, Chinese uh, peasant's uh, story, that every change comes in his life, somebody comes and says, you have been ruined or you are made. But he says, these are parts of my life, they are not absolute truth, and it will continue. The biggest problem with the media is because we are driven by scandal, because we are driven only by, uh, you know, minutiae, uh, useless things, then that's why we don't focus on, uh, you know, uh, economy, whenever we do, an anchor who has zero capacity, uh, uh, you know, in the private, uh, you know, channels will come on television and tell you something strange about economy. If you put everything together, it won't even work. Uh, this is the biggest problem. Uh, uh, earlier, Agda Saab was actually talking about, uh, you know, need for consensus. I'm all for it. Uh, I think on one side you look at it, there is consensus. 13 parties are together on one side of the divide, right? Only one pa party is sitting on the other side of the divide. So there is a mega consensus already there. 
the problem with that party that is out of power because it is populist is that 80%, uh, correct, uh, I can be wrong, but this is my overall assessment, that because of their populist nature, 80% of their first economic instincts are always wrong. And when you talk about uh, PMLN alone, uh, because they have been in power for quite some time in the past as well, they have earned enough uh, you know, governance from, uh, miles that 80% of their uh, you know, basic economic e instincts, when they're not being populist, are correct. Now the problem right now is that do one thing. Don't build consensus on anything else because every party has their own program. Just do one thing for heaven's sake. Ensure that uh, pick one finance minister and stick to him. Mm. Uh, you know, for past one year, you, when you look at it, how many finance ministers have we changed? If you can't even have one person at the helm of a economic ministry, finance ministry, what exactly are you going to do? Regarding exchange rate, uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, our friend here, uh, because uh, the biggest problem right now is that we try to fight it. When we do, it further actually shifts its uh, you know, ultimate resting position. Mm. And that is a problem. I think at this moment, everyone has to negotiate with IMF. Um, I have good news from international community as well. Remember, mm -hmm. there was a time when everybody used to say that Europe is going to freeze to death. Uh, mm. We are sitting in winters, and solstice is uh, gone. Solstice is gone, but uh, they are uh, alive and kicking. Similarly, when you talk about Ukraine war, it will eventually peter out. It has to. It cannot continue forever. So economic conditions around the world will start stabilizing as well. The only thing is that when you are negotiating with the, you know, of, uh, various stakeholders internationally, you should speak with one voice. In the end, everyone talks about fixing one problem, Sana, one problem, and that's it, that is fiscal deficit. If you have big uh, fiscal st deficit, if the problem is you earn less and you spend more, mm. everyone is going to create problem. Circular debt, if you can fix it, it is very important uh, otherwise, we will keep on talking about it. This is one uh, big problem that keeps on continuing to increase every time we check. It has to come down. Absolutely. And uh, we need to, of course, uh, take a look at all of these measures. Uh, Mr. Ali, you were, you were wanting to add something, I believe? I just want to add one small thing on what, mm. what Mr. Farooq was saying about the fiscal deficit. I'd like to note that you know, while we are talking about you know, possibility of uh, evading default, um, government, uh, you know, hard, ma managing hardly its finances. Mm. I'd like to mention that our households and firms do not have such problems because the households and firms, businesses, formal enterprises, and informal enterprises are able to manage their budgets very well. Mm. Uh, our, you know, speak, and, and speak for yourself, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, <laughs> it's well, the government finances mm. which is in, in the trouble. It's something we have to distinguish. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Right. Yes, may, 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 I, may I say so? Yes. Yes, yeah, on the, and the point that's just been made by Mr. Patafi and Ali Salman, I'd just like to remind your viewers that there is a fundamental difference between households, firms, and the government. You know, the households and the government, uh, households and the firms, they are not really responsible for those members of society that are left out for whatever reason, whereas the government is responsible and has political compulsion. So I think it's somewhat of an unfair comparison. Uh, to compare government that has some uh, public and political responsibilities to its citizens with firms and, uh, you know, households that only are responsible to immediate members of that household. So I just wanted to put that on the right. table. Uh, very, right. very quickly, I just wanted to add that the fundamental difference between the two is you can, uh, if the uh, company sinks, it, it is only one company that sinks. If a uh, household actually goes uh, south, that is one household. Countries cannot afford to actually go south, and it is important to remember. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Niaz Murtaza. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Zafzal, for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali Salman, for being with us in the studios, and thank you for, for being a part of the debate. As always, of course, we can only hope for important and serious measures taken towards the economic uplift of the country, uh, which requires uh, significant measures by our political leaders, and we hope that, that that can be taken, and in the remaining fiscal year, we take the news coming in for the country. That's all we have from the debate. We'll see you tomorrow.